My name is Kevin Vogt. I'm the Director of Sacred Liturgy, Music, and Art here at St. Michael the Archangel Parish. It's my pleasure to welcome all of you, especially those who are here for the first time, perhaps. Um, I see some of our parishioners here. I'm so glad that you came tonight as well. Uh, and uh, I'm glad that you're here to help me welcome all of our guests. This is the second in our series of Doxa Conversations at the Crossroads of worship, culture, and art. Now, if you are not of our uh, faith tradition, uh, let me assure you that our, my thinking, at least, about these ideas of worship, culture, and art are pretty broad and pretty expansive. Uh, the word worship simply means to ascribe worth, ultimate worth. And uh, the way that communities of humans in every tradition, every culture uh, uh, around the globe, um, ascribe ultimate worth to things or persons uh, is to celebrate in community with each other. And these communal celebrations are actually what create uh, community. So, uh, you know, since the, since the fall, if you will, um, Human, humanity has been uh, destined to toil for our daily bread, but toiling for a secondary end, as if we're some kind of cog in a machine or something, is not our destiny as human beings. We are destined for leisure in the fullest sense, not leisure in terms of inactivity, but rather life, a fullness of life that's worthy and valuable in and of itself, and not simply for the service of some other secondary purpose. And when we're living in that reality of leisure, in that sense, um, we are at worship. Um, and so that kind of cultic or worship activity of human communities then um, creates and embodies oh, the set of values that we share. And we're all here tonight because we must share at least some values, some, some if not beliefs, but some values. And that, val that those uh, shared values and beliefs are culture. An issue out of that culture then is what we do and what we make as human beings, the art. So worship, culture, art are, are phenomena that uh, happen in human communities and for human beings. In fact, this is the only way human beings can live, being social animals. T.S. Eliot said, what life have you if you have not life together? There is no life that is not in community. And he goes further to say, there is no community not lived in praise of God. Even if it's unconscious, it's still uh, life in community then simply it does ascribe worth to that which is ultimate. And so that's what we're here to explore tonight and, and in all the nights when we have a, a, this a series of presentations. Tonight it's a very specific kind of exploration and it has to do with uh, an experience that our society and really the, the global human family is experiencing and that is um, human trafficking and exploitation. Earlier this year, Pope Francis called human trafficking a crime against humanity. The selling and enslavement of human beings, especially women and children, uh, is closer to home than we might imagine. I know you've seen things on the news. We don't have to necessarily go from here to northeast Kansas City to see it happening. We can see it just a few blocks away at a quick trip or some other crossroads here. And we'll hear more about some of these statistics in the presentation. Uh, the Holy Father, Pope Francis, has said that we are to combat this exploitation and humiliation. Um, and to do that, the human stories must be told and brought into the light. Glass sculptor Haz Nassal takes on the mantle of a visual raconteur, telling the story of a local woman's journey out of darkness and into the light in a, actually a completed work a gallery work that we're going to see unveiled tonight, and also a proposal for a public uh, uh, installation as well. 
And this, uh, this proposed public installation is centered on uh, Kansas City's Lycan Square Park, which is the locus of an inspiring community revitalization project involving a remarkable array of partnerships and collaborations. We have uh, several people here tonight representing various uh, of those agencies. Um, and uh, I'd like to invite uh, Greg Lombardi to say a few words about the Lycans Project. As an attorney, uh, Greg has been instrumental in our community of um, doing <coughs> quiet title work, uh, researching and finding and, and, and paving the way to recovering titles for homes in blighted areas that makes it possible for other agencies then to come in and, and get loans from banks and to revitalize uh, neighborhoods and all that. So uh, Greg's a very visionary leader. He's also the uh, uh, executive director of the Lycans uh, Neighborhood Association. So um, would you please join me in welcoming Greg Lombardi. Thank you very much. So I'm going to start off uh, by asking how many of you know where Lycans is? Oh, so we have at least four people, which that's a good start. So Lycans is a proud uh, and humble community that is uh, two and a half miles directly east of downtown. Uh, does, anybody, does anybody know where the Elmwood Cemetery is? Okay, so, uh, uh, but Elmwood is in Lycans. Uh, if you go on I-70, there is what's called the Benton Curve. I-70 turns south. Anybody familiar with that? Okay, so we got some nodding of heads here. Uh, so immediately to the northeast of that is the Lycans neighborhood. Um, and so the, the north boundary is Independence Avenue, Benton is the west, Hardesty about a mile east of Benton is the eastern boundary, and Truman Road is the, the southern boundary. And uh, I've been working in the Lycans neighborhood for the last two years on a neat community development project, and I'm very excited that uh, that Hasna is, uh, is bringing her art to the project because it's, it's very emblematic of the project. Uh, Lycans, uh, for a long time, has been a challenged neighborhood. Uh, right now, it is one of the highest crime neighborhoods in Kansas City, but it is a neighborhood of great spirit and great potential. Um, there's a wonderfully diverse uh, group of people who lives there. It's about 50% Hispanic. There's a large uh, refugee population there. The, uh, the elementary school, there are 19 languages spoken at the elementary school. There's one kindergarten class where every single child in the class speaks a different language. Uh, and so, um, as you can imagine, it's a place of a lot of challenges, but also we see it as a place of, of great potential. And the project that I've been working on with a bunch of wonderful partners, including Habitat, uh, for Humanity with uh, Jude Hunts, who is here uh, tonight, uh, and with Catholic Charities and a bunch of other wonderful groups, is a project to focus resources on a really small area of, uh, of Lycans. Uh, it's a nine block area. The Neighborhood Association has worked with um, urban planners and with rehabbers and with builders to select this, uh, this nine block area as having the greatest potential in the neighborhood for development. Uh, we've developed building standards for the neighborhood, for the, the focus area. We've recruited rehabbers and builders uh, for the focus area. The rehabbers and builders to participate have to enter into an agreement uh, with the neighborhood association to comply with the building standards and to, to build good quality or rehab to good quality standards. Um, and so as of now, uh, in, t in 2020, uh, we will probably have 15 uh, units at a minimum rehab in this nine block focus area. Habitat for Humanity will be building three houses in the, in the focus area. Catholic Charities will be building three houses in the focus area. We'll be building a neighborhood association office. Uh, we also, to, if we're gonna hit it out of the park, we're teaming up with a developer who is working on what's called the Low Income Housing Tax Credit Project that is just uh, on the edge of the, this focus area where we're taking an old school and turning it into senior housing. So that would be 40, 40 units of senior housing that that would be built in uh, 2021 if, uh, if that project goes forward. 
The, the project has been so successful now that we have rehabbers bidding against each other uh, to rehab blighted properties in the focus area. And uh, it's a strange thing that, to have happen, but we have run out of blighted properties in the focus area. So we've actually had to expand the focus area. And to this, uh, Hasna brings artwork that is very emblematic of the struggles in the neighborhood and of, uh, of the problems that many people in the, the neighborhood face. Drug use and human trafficking are still uh, major problems in the neighborhood. If you go down Independence Avenue on any day where the temperature is over 40 degrees, uh, there is, uh, it's amazing, but there are prostitutes out on a, just a regular basis. Um, and at the same time, the hope uh, that Hosna's artwork uh, embodies is a hope that is felt very much in the neighborhood as well. That it is a time of transition, a time of revival in the neighborhood. So we're excited to work with Hasna uh, and we're excited to see her artwork in the park and we're amazed uh, and you know, tremendously impressed uh, with her fundraising work to, that can, uh, can and will actually make it happen. Anyway, with that, I'm going to turn the microphone uh, over to, to Jude from Habitat for Humanity. Thank you, Greg. So, as Greg mentioned, we are one of the many agencies that are involved in the Likens Neighborhood Revitalization Project. We um, currently have acquired six properties, and we'll start three this year and three next year. Um, and hopefully acquire more as, as the concentric circle around the park expands uh, as time goes on. But we were really very excited about this particular project because it's exactly what Habitat has been doing for 40 years. Uh, those of you who may remember the Ivanhoe neighborhood 15 or 20 years ago and how lighted that neighborhood was. And we and a, a few other agencies built many, many homes there. And now that neighborhood is turned around and it's a much uh, much improved uh, city asset now, rather than a liability. Um, so this is the kind of projects we like to be involved in. Um, so as we got involved in these meetings with Greg and these other partners, uh, I got to meet Hazna, and um, she had this vision for this art project, and she is a brilliant artist who said, I need to raise money for this. Uh, and so I um, said, well, Habitat will help you do that. Um, we don't know how to make art, we just know how to make houses. Uh, but <laughs> we will, uh, so we've been uh, working with her and if anybody's interested in supporting this project, uh, um, I've got some materials on the back table there and feel free to see me afterwards to, uh, to talk more about that. Um, and as, as, uh, as the universe would have it, not only did um, I didn't really need much more encouragement to be involved with Hasma, but when my dear friend Kevin Vogt got involved, I could not say no because I've known Kevin forever and Kevin has uh, a way with Catholic guilt that is second to none. Um, and so, <laughs> um, so hopefully uh, he will touch your hearts and, and um, it's been my, uh, I've been given the privilege of introducing Hasna to, uh, to share her vision with us about her art. And um, so please welcome Haas Nassau.
I want to thank all of you for coming here this evening. This has been the most difficult journey. Uh, I will confess, many days, many nights, I sleep, wake up with tears. I hug my son every morning. When, I, when he does not answer the phone, I get paranoid what happened to him. Because I have been walking this path with some of the most downtrodden women in society, children. This presentation is called Into the Light. So let me illuminate some facts, hard facts to you. Human trafficking is the second largest crime in the world, second only to gun violence. 100,000 children every year get sold into human trafficking. The average age for a person to get into prostitution is 11 or 12 years old. 40.3 million trafficked women and children in the world. United States is one of the largest consumers of human trafficking. $99 million is being spent, or rather generated, from human trafficking. These children come from abused or abandoned homes. And less than 1% get rescued. Missouri ranks 13th in the nation for human trafficking. Kansas ranks 27th. Jude tells me it's because the Northeast Corridor of Kansas City with Independence Avenue and Prospect Street, Spruce, um, Troost Avenue, that is the confluence of many arteries and therefore an influx of many uh, nefarious activities, platforms for nefarious activities to happen. These sex workers are divided into two categories, the indoor and the outdoor. The outdoor workers, as you can see, have it far worse than the indoor. And now I'm going to uh, show you some painful images of these young girls. This young girl is from Oklahoma. Her name is Corina. She ran away from home under false pretenses from um, this man who professed to love her, took her away, and she was sold into slavery. Five years of abuse. Abuse of body, abuse of mind. Five years later, at 17, when she tried to leave, they killed her. Two drug lords. Now they're in prison, and they will be released. This is Letty. Letty is from Houston, this beautiful young girl. She was 12 in middle school, and she was abducted. Her parents never knew, never saw her again. Two years, two years she suffered, lived in abysmal conditions. Finally, this young angel killed herself. And here is our local kiddo. This is Hope. She's from Topeka, Kansas. Again, she ran away from home, from an absentee father, and a mom who was always an alcoholic. She ran away, thinking that she found love, only to find that she was sold into slavery. Five years later, she tried to get out, and guess what? She's a felon, and now she's serving prison time. Why? Because in prostitution, if you're a prostitute, you're a felon, because prostitution is a felony. So a person pays for her. A person gets paid for her. She becomes the object. And when she says no, she is put in prison. And here is 
the protagonist of my story, the muse of my narrative, Christine MacDonald. I came to know about her from my friend, Dr. Jenny Chandra. We were having coffee one day when she told me about her story and I was so intrigued. I said, I, I have to go and meet her. And that was the day my entire life changed. Um, and, and people have asked me, why Christine McDonald? There are so many prostitutes and ex-prostituted women. Why her? Well, 20 years ago, <laughs> I feel like it was yesterday. I uh, always wore contact lenses, always had weak eyes. And uh, I, wore, I had a cornea elaboration. And for two weeks, my eyes had bandages and I couldn't see. Uh, I remember it like it was yesterday. It was the scariest uh, experience of my life, not knowing who came into the room, who left the room, um, just moving from one room to another, afraid I'm going to bang into something, I'm going to fall. Just walking down the, the steps of my college was so scary for me. I, I remember that so well. And here is this hero this local Kansas City hero. She is blind. She's a mother of three children. She's an ex-prostituted woman. She has been through gang rape, mutilation. She's shown me marks on her body. She's been through gun violence. She's been through anything and everything. And she's smiling and she's helping the community. She's helping the community. She travels from St. Louis all the way to Wichita, in a train, takes a bus. I don't know how she does it. And when I see her, now I feel like nothing is impossible. I can do anything. And I feel ashamed as an architect and an artist. What am I doing for my community? What am I doing? God has blessed me so much more. It's my duty to give back as she is giving. She's a social worker. She advocates for human trafficking, the fight against human trafficking, and she is pursuing uh, a degree in criminal justice from Penn Valley Community College. This is what she's doing. This is her home. And this, she lives in a trailer park, which gets flooded in the summer, at which time she and her son have to leave and find shelter elsewhere. She is still looking for a home. This is that corner where she worked as a prostituted person. She tells me that they're very territorial about their place. You, you can't go and stand there. It's like that's where her clients come. And, um, and there she is between two churches. And uh, the church actually barricaded the space because she used to go and people like her used to go and stand under the canopy when there would be snow and rain and hail. So they didn't want that, so they created that barricade. So in every which way, she's on the street. This is Independence Avenue. So you know, when we are all nice and warm and cozy in our beds, sleeping in the night, safe and comfortable, after months of being a, essentially like a rodent in the city, seeking shelter in abandoned buildings, scavenging for food in the dumpsters, and when the stench of her own body odor she cannot take, that's when she crawls into this fountain and she takes a bath here. And these are the steps right on East 8th Avenue where she comes and she meets some of her friends and they take a brief respite of three or four days before what they call the dope man comes and throws some drugs at them and say, get up and go and work. And so they get up and they go again. Here is a small clip of the conversation I had with Christine and her friend Kathy, both ex-prostituted women. What, what do you do, Kathy? Today, um, you know, I've involved myself in, a, in, in the body of Christ. That's okay. the best thing that I have uh, that I have done is I've accepted Jesus as my Savior. He's my Lord. Um, I believe that um, He reached me even out here. He put those 
uh, people in place and that's today also what needs to happen for these ladies out here. My family, I have a very supportive and loving family. Prostitution and crack addiction because of this one person who molested your daughter and um, and gave made you as a mother feel very guilty and so that was your way of punishing yourself. It was a way of punishing myself, but you know, I had, I've had other trauma in my life, trauma as a child. Um, like I said, I never felt like I belonged. So even as a child, uh, I would go off to this special field that I had and uh, under my special tree and I would pull the grass up and I would make a circle in the dirt. And he was Mr. Smiley and he became an actual person and he became my, my friend. And we went on all of these excursions together and I became a different person because of, of the things that were happening at home. Um, like I said, my dad was an alcoholic and um, sometimes um, it was me that he called out of bed and would take me to the table and tell me that I would never amount to anything or he'd never be proud of me. Um, that I was a and a slut. I was 11, 12 years old. I don't think I'd even had sex yet. So, but that was his outlet as far as his alcoholism in the cycle that he was in. You know, and I certainly, I so forgive him and I understand now that that, that cycle of addiction and how it affects your family and everybody around you. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not just a one person disease, it's a family, it's a community disease mm -hmm. where everyone has to come together. Somebody is selling somebody on the corner, even if it's, I mean, the perception of is it's your man and he cares about you, right? Not true. And then you're on the corner, somebody's paying for you, so there's money in exchange or something of monetary value. Maybe that's food. Maybe that's a safe place to sleep. Doesn't have to be cash. Maybe it's drugs to fuel your addiction. So dude's going to get his sexual gratification off of that thing of monetary value to objectify your body. So I've moved around a lot. Just I don't, I don't go on that because I didn't want to do that. Because there are unintended consequences. I have cousins and I have... You know, people and effects. You got to think yeah. about how that affects everybody, and and even for my own kids, I don't want to paint that picture of them. You know, when they're older and they can understand it and wrap their brain around, we can have those conversations. But that's why I didn't go into deep detail. There it was intentional, but it was very bad. <laughs> it was very bad. Um, I never knew my father. My mom did not know who my father was, so there was no dad, right? Um, and I have siblings. I have two older brothers and a older sister and they were taken away from our home when I was three. I was put back in the home and they were put up for adoption. Tell me about these steps. You, you seem very the particular steps? about yes, yeah, the, the steps. steep yeah. steps. Why, yeah. why are they so important to your story? You're oh. very clear about exactly where they were. Yeah, yeah. I, I, love yeah tell me about I love those steps. I love those steps. I mean, I sit on these steps too. Don't get me. I used to sit on these steps to wait for the dope man. Yeah. Exactly. So oh, they they drive by just to give us a, a wake up. Uh -huh. We called because they so knew we would get on the we, corner and make money. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yes, but, absolutely. But I would they would honk. Oh, they no, would no, come no. by. Oh, they come no. by. Just throw it out the window. Oh, here you go, Kathy. Wake up. Wake up. And they throw dope at you. Yes. So we could go. We that would wake us up. So we could go out We'd and go back on the corner and make them money. And if you so. were hungry, you would curb the the hunger pain. Yes. 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 I remember that. You know. You know. We always have to think about. When I, when I do a, a presentation in front of like professionals, I always tell people, we're all a book. When we all enter the world through the book cover, because yeah. you know, we're all born. And how that birth looks is different for all of us in those moments, but we're all born. And then we all die, and how we die is different for all of us. But all those things in between, all those chapters, um, lead up to where we are in that present moment. And, and, and so often we look at that present moment and that present behavior and we don't think about all those steps and things that happened prior to lead you into that moment in time. And then we judge based on that behavior and that moment in which we encounter people. You put together a game plan and you cry for the pain that you know, you're experiencing that nobody gives a damn and nobody's there to wipe your tears and nobody's going to clean your cuts and, and um, suck it up and you go do it all over again. So while we sat and talked, this is the location that we are at, looking at Lycan Square Park. And look at this park, it's so beautiful. The first time I came here, I didn't even know the criminal activities that go on over here. It is just an absolutely silent, tranquil space. But the most eerie thing about it is that 
there is nobody here. Even on a weekend in the afternoon, when the children playing in the streets, there's nobody here. So the most beautiful thing that's happening right now is five agencies are coming together to revitalize this area. And as Greg and jo Jude pointed out, Lycan's Neighborhood Association, Tykin KC, Maddie Rhodes, Catholic Charities, and Habitat for Humanity, they are coming together to revitalize this community. When I came to know about it, I was reminded of what happened 15 years ago when I was on the board of directors for Habitat for Humanity in Topeka, Kansas. NAWIC, National Association for Women in Construction, and Habitat for Humanity, we had come together and created, and we were remodeling houses. I was working on this house, 1223 Lincoln Street. We were so proud of this house. It was for a young family with 16 kids. And about two years later, I wanted to go and see that place again. So I went back. This is what I found. And I thought about it so much, and I realized why that had happened. And it's so interesting that um, our new art commissioner, Mr. James Martin, is here today. Um, I'm very honored to say. Um, but Mr. Martin said this in the Kansas City Magazine as well, that uh, a, the, he, he, he emphasized the importance of public art. Public art is very important for creating a sense of community in a neighborhood. It actually brings a group of people, a, bro a group of houses together in shared togetherness, in a sense of belonging, in a sense of community. That was what was lacking in this house. We had remodeled the houses, but we had not given them a sense of belonging. Mm, Mr. Martin said in the Kansas City Magazine, he said, a community or a nation can be divided into opposite views. They can be polarized, but when there is a work of art in that space, then one side starts talking about that work. The other sta side starts listening. And then they add to it, or they may say something against it. And then these people talk, and that people talk, and these people talk. And then slowly, communication starts to happen organically. And people who would not want to listen to each other are now communicating. And what happens when communications happen? Dialogues happen. When dialogues happen, resolutions happen. The community progresses. That is the most important work that a public art can generate. It creates a center. It creates a nexus, what we architects call an axis mundi, spiritus centralis, creating a locus point creating that center, just like the nucleus of the atom that we are all made up of, creating that center that brings in, um, neighborhoods together, communities together, nations together. I'm going to illustrate with certain examples. The Statue of Liberty. This is a country of immigrants. And we all see the Statue of Liberty and it resonates with us. Freedom, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It is our right. This is what the Founding Fathers have given us. So when we see this, we are all connected as citizens of the United States. The plaza, the country club plaza, our pride and joy. A slice of Seville, Italy, brought to Kansas City with the Roman gods and goddesses. J.C. Nichols, Fountain. I'm sure that when you all drive by, you look at the fountain to see what is the color? What color does it have? And oh, did the chiefs win? Did the royals win? Or if it's Christmas, color and light become so, so symbolic of this installation, this public artwork. 
the thinker at the Rodan, at, at the Nelson Atkins, doesn't this remind you of the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C.? The, the pride of place with l overlooking the city beyond. And the crying giant, which is really about a personal journey. Uh, again, I'm going to quote uh, Mr. Martin who says, sometimes a public work is just there and uh, you pass by and it comes upon you by surprise and it engages you. I, in my opinion, this is one of those works. It creates a personal narrative between the viewer and the work. A moment in time, laughing children, children playing in the water. The shuttlecocks taken by these uh, 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 Swedish, uh, Finnish art artists uh, taking a painting from within the museum and placing it around the park in a seemingly haphazard fashion but really uh, uh, is a, a nod to site inclusion. But of all of these, of all of these public art monuments, the one that resonates the most with me is this one, the Holocaust Memorial. By the way, tomorrow is the 75th anniversary of the freedom of Jews in Auschwitz by the Soviets. So the whole world is rejoicing, right? Yeah. And um, the six glass towers are there, which represents the six death camps and representing the six million Jews that died, okay? But why are we making these memorials? We're making these memorials because when this was happening to the Jews, we were silent. The world was silent when one race was getting annihilated through anti-Semitism. We, all over the world, we were quiet. And now we are remorseful. Countries, governments are remorseful. So all over the world, we are creating these memorials to say we are sorry. Is it the end? Is there no victimization going on now? It is the fastest growing crime in the world. And it is happening right under our noses. And we are doing nothing. We are looking the other way. I'm going to read this out. They first came for the communists. But I did not speak up because I was not a communist. Then they came for the Jews. And I did not speak up because I was not a Jew. Then they came for the trade unionists. And I did not speak up because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Catholics. And I did not speak up because I was a Protestant. And then they came for me. And by that time, there was no one left to speak up. The crime that is happening today is affecting the most vulnerable segment of our community, our children. 100,000 children every year are getting sold into slavery. This is true emancipation. Lycans Square Park. As I stood at the step, the, at the top of the stairs over here, I didn't know what was below. I was standing there with Christine McDonald. She kept talking about these stairs. She said, at the bottom of those steps over there, that's home for us. That's where we all met, my friends and I met. And you know, that is where my friend Rick died. And I said, and, and she's named her son after him, but um, he was 16, an African-American beautiful boy, raped and murdered right there at the bottom of those steps. And he's not just one incident. There are so many incidents. That green grass, has the blood of so many innocent bodies. And if you don't believe me, take a look at this. This is what I found when I walked down there. And as I walked through this path, this beautiful path, like I said, not a soul in sight, 
a lot of beautiful houses with porches, screen porches and rocking chairs outside, nobody in sight. But as I walked through the space, I could feel the breeze and I could smell the grass and I could hear the rustling of the leaves and the birds and, and, and just, it was such a beautiful space. And I'm so excited that these five agencies are coming together to revitalize this place. And we have a new art commissioner, James Martin, for the city, for Kansas City. It is a perfect combination of all these dynamic individuals who are going to come together and drive these criminals away from this place. Here is my proposal as an artist. I propose these lampposts that are already there. We put glass, large glass um, panels that really tell a story so that as you walk through the space, the story becomes revealing to you. So this place has so much history. This place has lost so many lives of victims yesterday, today, and tomorrow. They should not be forgotten. They should be remembered. And and so when they do this revitalization project, when we make these glass panels, put up these glass panels over here, they will, as people walk through the space, we will see what the history of Kansas City was. The history of Kansas City is no different from the history of another city. But I think we as a community should not take these stories and shove it under the rug. We should celebrate these stories because these stories are not about evil and, and doom. These stories are about triumph. They are about celebration. These stories are about people coming together and helping people. This is what I propose. So there are four lampposts along that walking path that are existing right now in the space exactly four uh, lampposts from the bottom of the stair there's one over there then about 40 to 60 feet further there's another one so like that there are four and then the walking path ends so as you walk through each space each each lamppost the story reveals itself to you the first one being isolation where a young girl is being abducted and taken by the pimp in the car away from her home to be sold into slavery. And by the way, in this installation, I'm really showing hands, hands as a motif for conveying a story. Because for me, I take um, uh, inspiration from artists like Michelangelo and Raphael Michelangelo. As you know, one of his most famous works is the Sistine Chapel, where God and man touching each other with the finger. Or Raphael, the School of Athens in the Papal Chambers in the, at the Vatican, where he shows philosophers, mathematicians, astronomers, just by what they're holding in their hand. So the hand is so important um, in, in my installation as well. So as you can see, the pimp's hand is large and dark and, and her hands are small and frail and she's trying to move it away, but she cannot. So this is isolation. This is damnation, where she is now under the complete influence of drugs. Her her, her eyes are vacant, she cannot see, uh, she, she doesn't know where she is, and her hands are out there as if to say, I surrender, I surrender, please don't do anything to me. Do whatever uh, you, you need to do and, and you know, I'll, I'll be your slave, but don't hurt me. And there is the pimp threatening her. Uh, I'm reminded of Mark Twain's uh, saying, he says, of all the things I've lost in my life, I miss my mind the most. And that is what the women said too. Um, they, they just don't even remember a large part of their life. I mean, it's just years became hours for them. They're just, they're, they are like walking carcasses, emaciated versions of themselves because they're not eating. They're just, they're living on dope. They're just day after day after day, barely sleeping. So now it's just skin and bones. 
And here is the church in the background with the lights on, but the door closed. And here is that pedestrian looking at them or perhaps away from them, but um, oblivious to what is happening at the bottom of the stairs. And those stairs are the stairs of Lycan's Park, the infamous stairs where all the activities, the criminal activities happen. Our Kansas City fountains mm, resplendent in color and, and, and light, um, but of no use to uh, our enslaved women and children. And then there's us, represented as the buildings, silent in the background, not knowing, not wanting to know. And there's redemption. So um, after working for 16 years in uh, slavery, she got blind, Christine got blind, and she um, managed to get out. Uh, the church reached out to her, and that's the pastor's hand reaching out to her and, 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 uh, and her hand is on her heart as if to say, uh, I, I, I choose to live, I want to live. It's, this is what she always told me, she said, Hasna, so many people passed me by when I was on the street. Uh, nobody ever stopped to watch me. They looked at me and they would immediately turn away. They never stopped to help. For the first time, she got help from the church and that's how she turned her life around. The church, as you can see, is now in the foreground and the street lights are illuminating her. And finally, she's focused, her eyes are focused again. She can see again. And this is the last panel, Salvation, in which she has a book in her hand and for the first time, she's inside a house. For all of us, the most safe, the most loving place where we are loved and cared for. And we look forward to at the end of the day, wherever we are in the world, is to get back home. These women don't have a home. Their only wish in life is to have safety and love. And so this last panel is really her dream come true. This is what she's fighting for even now. And if you see her hands, this is just a twist in the story for those who hear the tale and then I'm sure it will be lost through time. But um, people ask me, what is she reading? She's not reading, she's actually closing the book. If you see her thumb, it's outside the book, it's not in the book. And the, the reason she's closing the book is because she's blind, she cannot see. So this <coughs> is the installation. Like Mr. Martin said, there are two opposite uh, polarized um, parts to this concept, this phenomena, this reality of human trafficking. The past one year, uh, people asked me, what are you doing? And I said, oh, you know, I'm doing my project with human trafficking. They're like, what a waste of time. You know, these women, they bring it on themselves. This is easy money for them. I work hard for a living. From morning to night, I'm working, okay? I am a tax-paying citizen of the United States. Look at them, they're just there and, you know, they're just a burden on society. I'm just one person. I cannot fight with everybody. I don't have the energy and I don't have the time. And I know I cannot convince anybody. But I know this, that when there is a public art installation in the park, it's going to generate a conversation. It's going to generate a conversation because this is reality and there are a lot of women right there, around there. And like Kevin said, like Dr. Kevin both said, right here in our neighborhood too, we just don't know. And so this installation is really a memorial. It's a memorial for all the victims who have given their lives, who have, who have had to sacrifice their lives just because of fate, just because of where they're born, because they are not blessed like all of us in this room. They didn't have a proper childhood. They were stolen or they had to run away because they, they, their environment was so unsafe. From one safe environment to another unsafe environment, can you imagine what their lives must have been like? Like Christine McDonald said to me, Hasna, imagine the worst day of your life and multiply it 10 times and it comes close to what we feel every day of our lives. So it is a memorial 
for these victims because we should not forget. It's also a memorial for all those people, the women and men who are helping them, ministering to them, spending their entire life's work. We know um, um, uh, sisters in um, uh, Troost Avenue, in, in churches, who spend their entire uh, life taking care of them. So uh, there are so many blessed people uh, who, who are doing this work, and this is a memorial for them. It's also an intervention. It's an intervention into a current, into a present problem because we need to confront those who are perpetrating this crime and we need to give hope to those who are, who are in, 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 in embedded in the cycle of poverty, addiction and exploitation. And finally, it's a celebration. It's a celebration of hope for the community, for a better future. And it is also hope for the solidarity and togetherness of our communities. When we come together and we do something good, it really and truly brings the whole world together. As poet George Herbert says in the windows, doctrine and life, color and light, when they combine and mingle bring a great sense of regard and awe. But speech alone vanishes like a flaring thing, and in the ear, not conscience ring. Ladies and gentlemen, I bring you into the light. Perhaps an instrument that, more intimate than almost any instrument except the human voice. Expensive Venetian fused glass. Opulent art. And for what? For whom? Worship, culture, art. Art. Worship. We adorn what we love. We adorn with jewels. We adorn with chacons, counterpoint, wasted notes. We adorn what we love whom we love, worship, culture, art, memorial, intervention, celebration. Thank you all for coming tonight. Won't you linger a bit for conversation, a little wine, a little food? Deepest gratitude Keith Stanfield for that precious music. Thank you, Keith. To Hazasal 
for sharing her art with us, for sharing her soul with us. And let's adorn what we love. Thank you.